Hi everyone and welcome to the first UK Public Sector Virtual Tableau User Group. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes for any latecomers and then we'll make a start. Hi everyone, it's three minutes past now, so we'll make a start. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome you all to the first UK Public Sector Virtual Tableau User Group. I'm Mike Henry, Head of Intelligence and Performance at Kirklees Council, and I'm the co-leader of the group, along with James Goodall, who works in the Data Analytics Centre of Excellence at Surrey County Council. We have over 160 people registered for today's event from over 110 public sector organisations right across the UK, which is a fantastic for our first user group. The group and the forum have been set up as places where Tableau users working in the public sector across the UK can learn from and support each other, share experiences and knowledge, explore lessons learned, both good and bad, and identify and explore opportunities for collaboration. Quite often we're facing similar challenges, deliver similar services and use similar systems. So I think there's huge potential for kind of collaborating across the sector. For our first user group, James and I thought we would lead by example. I'm going to be talking about Kirklees Council's ambition to become an intelligence-led council and the role of Tableau in supporting the delivery of that ambition. James will then talk about some of the work being done in Surrey County Council to develop a data community through visualization centered events. If you have any questions during the event, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the page rather than the chat. James and I will do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. And the slides from today's event will be posted in the forum following the event and the event itself will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So, as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm the Head of Intelligence Performance at Kirklees Council. So I've been with Kirklees since January 2018 and I'm responsible for the Council's intelligence and data strategy. Prior to working for Kirklees Council, I've spent about 15 years working in a number of public sector organisations, mainly in local government, but also in public transport and fire and rescue. I first came across Tableau in 2015, and from memory, I think we're on around about version 9.1 at the time. I thought the product was amazing back then, but it's come on leaps and bounds up to the current version of 2019.1. Today, I'm going to talk about Kirklees Council's vision to become intelligence-led. 
how are we making that vision a reality and the role of Tableau in our intelligence transformation journey. We define intelligence led in Kirklees as using intelligence and insight to inform and evaluate what we do, how we do it and what difference it makes. And data analytics is a significant part of that. I thought I'd start by providing a bit of information about Kirklees and the council. So Kirklees is located in West Yorkshire and it's the 11th most populous district in England and most populous borough in England that is not a city with a population of just over 437,000. In terms of area, Kirklees is the third largest met district in England and 70% of the land is Greenbelt land and the largest town in Kirklees is Huddersfield. The council employs approximately 7,000 staff with a controllable budget of around 290 million. By next year, the funding from central government would have reduced by approximately 60p in the pound since 2010. So as with most public services, operating within these financial constraints at a time of increasing demand with increasing complexity presents a whole range of challenges. For those not familiar with local government, we deliver around 1,500 separate services. So that's a set of actions or activities undertaken by the council to deliver a product to our conclusion. In terms of data, we have lots. We have approximately 200 systems in the council, along with hundreds of access databases and millions of Excel spreadsheets. And a key priority for us is how we work in partnership with other public sector organisations. And with that comes a significant programme of work around how we integrate intelligence across organisations. The council has a strategic commitment to become intelligence led. Having this level of strategic buying is very useful, start, very useful starting point for any intelligence analytics program. So with that strategic commitment and vision, I'm now going to talk about how we make that vision a reality. The first of three strands I'm going to talk about today is people and skills. No amount of technology or data investment is going to change how an organization works without ensuring you've got the right people with the right skills working in the right culture to both generate and consume intelligence. From the analyst side, we're investing in developing the skills of our analysts from both a technical skill point, but just as importantly from a customer relationship side. This will enable our analysts to work more effectively with our customers with a focus on how intelligence and insight can support outcomes, be that problem solving or supporting decisions, rather than starting with data. We're also investing in additional analytical capacity so that we can meet the needs of all services across the council. From the consumer side, we want to create the right conditions to develop an intelligence-led culture across the organisation. So we've done a lot of work with colleagues across the council to understand the factors driving the current culture so that we can understand what needs to change. One of the main issues we've identified is the level of data literacy across the council. To address that, we're currently, looking the, we're currently in the process of designing an organisation development programme to improve the data literacy skills of staff at all levels. Tailored to roles, that programme will cover all aspects of data literacy, from the importance of high quality data, collection all the way through to interpretation and critical thinking skills. We want staff across the council to be armed not only with the skills to consume intelligence and insight, but also the ability to identify areas where data analytics can support outcomes. The second strand and potentially the biggest challenge we have is data. We're investing in additional capacity to develop a robust data architecture across the council. And one of our priorities for this year is to develop a data strategy. That will set out the strategic vision and the plan for the council's data assets. Having a technical data architecture is one thing, but it's just as important, if not more important, to have appropriate policies, procedures, standards and governance in place to assure the quality of the data you're working with. We know we've got a significant amount of work to do, but getting our data in a fit state to make it usable for analysts is essential. The third strand, and again, an area we are investing in, is tools, and specifically ensuring we've so we've got the right tools to do the job in the most efficient way and the right tools to communicate and present intelligence in the most effective way. Which brings me on to the main reason you're all tuned in today, Tableau. So how will Tableau support our ambition to become an intelligence-led organisation? Well, it will support all three strands I've just talked about. But why Tableau? So last year we carried out an evaluation of a number of platforms to see how they could support some of the challenges we are facing common challenges many organizations can relate to. These include time consuming data and intelligence development processes, tabular text-based outputs, and very little standards or consistency across the organization. Static reports and products being distributed by email in a manual way that were often days, if not weeks out of date when they arrived with our customers. Content that was predominantly descriptive 
with very little diagnostic insight and no ability for customers to generate their own insight. Very manual and very time consuming data management and data preparation processes. Um, access to data and reports that were reliant on the availability of staff and limited access to modern tools and a significant reliance on Microsoft Excel access and business objects for data extraction, transformation, analysis and reporting. We assessed the technical capabilities of a number of platforms and took an approach of providing staff involved in the evaluation with limited upfront training so we could evaluate the learning curve required for each platform. However, our approach took into account more than just the technical capabilities and cost. We also looked at the quality of customer support. We got feedback from existing customers. We looked at investment in research and development. We had conversations about product roadmaps and we assessed the availability of resources to support continued learning. Based on all of those factors, we made the decision to invest in Tableau. During the evaluation, one of the guys working on the project used an analogy that I think perfectly sums up Tableau. He said of one of Tableau's competitors, it's like a light aircraft, easy to get started but limited in its capabilities. Of Tableau, he said it's like a fighter jet. It takes a little longer to find your way around, but once you do, the sky's the limit. Now, this shouldn't put you off Tableau. Tableau is relatively easy to get started with. The key thing here is the point about its potential. It was the only platform we looked at that could deliver all of our essential technical requirements. And with Tableau, you're not just investing in the technology. You're buying into a fantastic community of users, a community that not only supports each other, but is actively involved in developing the platform through suggesting ideas for new features. Which brings me on to how Tableau will enable and support our vision. <clears throat> so first up is Tableau Prep Builder. Tableau Prep Builder allows us to connect to a range of data sources and build data flows that optimize data for analysis. The tool's intuitive visual interface empowers analysts who may not have specialist data engineering skills to combine, transform, clean data ready for analysis. The second tool is Tableau Desktop. Tableau Desktop gives us the ability to generate insights quicker than ever before through visual analytics. Again, the intuitive user interface enables analysts to analyze data on the fly and iteratively develop visualizations and dashboards to share with staff across the council. Which brings me on to the third tool, which is Tableau Server. Tableau Server gives us a platform where we can securely share dashboards developed in Tableau Desktop with staff across the council, empowering the people who know the business and know the data best to generate intelligence and insight through visual analytics. From my experience, consumers love how easily Tableau is to use and how quickly they can start to generate new insights through visual data exploration. I've seen how quickly people start to engage with data, begin to understand the importance of data quality, and start to recognize the ben benefits of data analysis, all contributing to the culture change I was talking about earlier. Tableau Server also gives us the ability to schedule Tableau prep flows and Tableau dashboards, so that staff across the council have access to up-to-date data and the tools they need to analyze that data on demand. We're currently two months into our implementation of Tableau. We decided to take a three phase approach to implementing Tableau with the support from Concentra Analytics. The first phase, which is scheduled to last approximately three months, focuses in all the key things you need to consider with an enterprise deployment, which I'll touch on in more detail in a moment, as well as skilling up the staff in our center of excellence. For our analysts, this is about providing them with the development and time to learn and build up their confidence in using Tableau. The second phase, which is likely to be three to four months, will see us move into an initial delivery phase. Using an agile approach, we're aiming to complete four to five sprints before moving on to our final phase. The embed phase is where the use of Tableau becomes business as usual for our analysts and for the organization. Our center of excellence approach is time limited. The staff in the center of excellence are being developed as our Tableau experts during the first two phases, with the aim of using the skills developed within the center of excellence to develop the Tableau exper expertise of all of our analysts as we move into embedding Tableau in the council. It's also worth mentioning that the development focus of our center of excellence is not solely on Tableau software. We're also developing the team skills in areas such as visual analytics, visual design principles and best practices, and new ways of working such as Agile. I briefly mentioned enterprise deployment considerations and I just want to go through this in a bit more detail. If you're considering an enterprise deployment, it really is worth committing the time up front to these things as it will save you a significant amount of time in the long run. Considering carefully plan your infrastructure and architect requirements at the outset, you'll need the ability to scale up your infrastructure as the use of Tableau expands across the organization. From an architecture side, think about who your end users will be. 
can you manage this through separate sites or will you need separate production environments? As I touched on earlier, with an increased focus on partnership working and integrated intelligence, we're looking at two production environments to manage the content. For internal users, so that's council employees who have active directory accounts on the council's network, and then also for external users, so non-council employees who work in partnership with the council but don't have a council network account. It's worth considering how you're planning on engaging the organisation with Tableau. From my experience, this means focusing on the capabilities you're bringing into the organisation and the benefits this will deliver. Other than communicating and engaging with the council's senior leadership team, we haven't widely broadcast our investment in Tableau. This will come as we start to showcase the capabilities of the platform using real life examples of how Tableau is making a difference to customers across the council. We also need to consider how you plan to evaluate the success and benefits of Tableau. Measuring the number of dashboards and the number of users and the usage of the dashboards is important, but think about how you measure the difference Tableau is making. One way I've done this in the past is to try and get the use of individual dashboards with improvements in individual team performance. Training, and more specifically, giving analysts the time to build their skills and confidence in Tableau is very important. Think about how you create the space and the time for analysts to play with Tableau and don't expect them to fit this in alongside the day job, particularly in the early days. Setting standards and governance at the outset saves a significant amount of time in the long run. Having these in place will provide consistency in the look and feel of your dashboards and in turn, build trust and confidence amongst your customers. So that's it from me today. If you have any questions about anything I've just talked about, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to contact me following the event to discuss anything I've mentioned in more detail, please feel free to do, to do so. I'll now hand over to James, who's going to talk about the work being done in Surrey County Council to develop a data community through visualisation sensitive events. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, so yeah, uh, as Mike said at the start, it's really exciting to be a part of this, um, this start of the community that we're trying to build here. So I mean, as we, as we talk about quite often in the public sector, um, working collaboratively with other organisations can quite often be key to achieving things that we need to do, but we don't end up actually managing to achieve those goals. So I think that um, this is hopefully going to be the start of um, of that that collaborative journey for all of us. But so um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, developing a data community and I will just get my slides up now. Okay. Excellent. So as the name suggests, uh, I am talking about developing a data community, the power of viz. And I'll come on to what that actually means in a second, but I'll start off by telling you a bit more about who I am. So as Mike said at the start of the, um, of the event, my name's James Goodall, and I'm the analytics support specialist here at Surrey, working in the Data Analytics Center of Excellence. Now, I've been in this role since uh, September 2018, where before this, my background was in adult social care systems and performance analytics. Um, before I go on with the main content of my presentation, I think it, um, I think it would be useful to provide some content, uh, context and explain where we, as an organisation, currently are on our Tableau journey. So we started using Tableau in 2015-16 with a relatively small group of both desktop and server users initially, mainly to try and scale out the potential capabilities of Tableau and understand how we felt this could best be deployed at scale. So over time, obviously, the word got out about the usefulness and practical applications that Tableau can have on business insights as, as well as day-to-day -day processes. And so naturally, we've seen the use grow exponentially to the point where we're now supporting, I think it's over 80 desktop users. And we've got almost 2,000 active server users. So this does put us in a position where we're relatively mature users as far as Tableau goes. However, while our staff may have been using Tableau for quite a while, this has largely been in isolation, with the only contact they regularly have with, each, with one another outside of their own teams happening at our internal user groups or via sporadic, kind of usually service-specific workshops. Now, there have been ongoing efforts to promote the data community. However, until now, we've not had a resource with a specific remit in this area. So the work that has been completed, while obviously being essential and people involved have been doing a fantastic job, 
and it has certainly got us to where we need to be, got us in a great position. It has only been achievable through the goodwill of members of the data analytics team, as well as a few um, great ambassadors within the community. And so that's where my role comes in. So as well as the technical IT side of my job, part of my role involves assisting our staff with their self-service analytical needs, but also a chunk of my time is spent dedicated to developing the data community. And so that's what I'm talking about today. So I'll be going through why I believe a data community is important. I'll offer my opinions on ways you might be able to achieve this within your organization and tell you about some of the things we've done here at Surrey to push this forward. And also, as the title may suggest, go through a recent example of how we've used Viz Games to help us on this journey. Now, I should say that I believe we are still very much at the start of our wider data community journey, but I hope I can pass on some experiences and thoughts that you might find useful and may have some potential for application within your organization. So, before we get into the main detail of what I want to discuss today, I think, I think we should address the key question here, which is why is a data community important? And to answer this, I think we need to start looking at some of the negative impacts of not having a community-driven data culture. So one of the most common examples that I can think of that's worth addressing is to do with collaboration. Now, collaboration within an organization without this joined up community can typically be very challenging with people and teams tending to have a really tight grip on their data and not allowing anyone else in. And there can, there can be a lot of different reasons for people taking this approach. And some of them are you know, absolutely genuine. You know, certain teams dealing with particularly sensitive data sets, for example. However, that in itself shouldn't be a barrier to collaborative working. And there are ways that you can combat this, which, which I hope to come on to a little bit later on. So I think that another um, really negative impact of a disconnected community, leading on from the previous point that I was talking about, is where it leads to silo working. And I think this is a problem that a lot of us can probably relate to, is that you know, it regularly affects many different organizations, no matter what their background. And this, this can be particularly harmful to a data culture, leading not only to duplication, so in other words, you know, different people doing very similar things, but with no knowledge of what each other are doing, or possibly even knowing that each other exists. But, um, but it can also end up resulting in actual tangible costs to an organization, you know, by paying for, um, paying for training or staff taking longer to complete tasks that might already be being done elsewhere. So an effective data community allows you to break these barriers down and make the best use of all of the skilled analysts and IT professionals that you might have. And so by sharing this knowledge and working with each other to improve and collaborate on your outputs, it's my belief that the organization as a whole will benefit. And an engaged and active data community also allows you to foster and develop good practice within an organization. And so, you know, it ensures that all staff, while obviously working with different data on different tasks, are all working towards the same shared goal. And so everyone benefits from each other's input into that community. Now, there'll obviously be some individuals um, or teams within a community, particularly in the early stages, who shine in terms of capability, you know, either that could be technical or analytical. However, once that community starts to work collaboratively with each other, that skills gap should narrow. Um, and it should also help to alleviate any pressure that might currently be placed on specialist teams within the organization, you know, for example, um, technical IT teams or advanced business intelligence teams. As you know, with, with, with that dissemination of knowledge and skills, more members of the community are able to help each other out without having to rely on that single or at least narrowly defined point of contact. And so this is absolutely our goal here at Surrey. And while we may not have fully achieved it yet, I think, I think we are definitely on the way. So if you've just listened to that and you're thinking, okay, that sounds great. Where do I start with this? Um, hopefully the next few suggestions based on some of my experiences might give you a good starting point. So the first one is one I referenced a moment ago, and it's to do with breaking down those barriers that exist between individuals and teams within your organization. Now this can be a very long and a very hard road to travel, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile one in the end. And the main challenge here tends to be around people being unwilling or unable to share their data sets with other colleagues. But there's a few basic things you can do to try and address this. So taking your suggestions to them and showing them the benefits of working in this way is a very good start. You know, 
once once you start organizing those community-based sessions involving colleagues from across the organization and people get to see the outputs and the benefits from this approach it's quite likely that their approach to this may change but for those who are willing but unable to share their data you know for instance due to sensitivity issues then you could um, start looking at the possibility of anonymizing those data sets, obviously being extra careful about leaving any identifiable patterns in that data, you know, that might lead to individuals or sensitive elements being exposed. Or, or you could even try aggregating that data up um, to a higher level, so removing those identifiably individual data points. And that way, you could start to have a group working on a particular task on a particular data set and just take the ideas and design around that output and just apply it back to the original data source. To do that kind of thing, you'll probably need some assistance from your IT departments uh, to help facilitate it, as it's, you know, it's unlikely that analysts working within a particular sector within an organization would naturally be able to access other departments' data. So if you're looking at setting anything up uh, across departmental up, then I'd always suggest um, involving those people that can help enable you to progress this and get them on board from the outset. So another thing um, that I'd suggest looking at is online tools like forums. So they're a great way for a community to stay in contact and be kept up to date with what's happening, whether that's you know, through the sharing of tips and tricks, how-to guides, blog posts, uh, events. Um, so we use Jive forums here, and uh, <laughs> granted at the moment, I'm the main contributor. I, I still think it's a really fantastic way to keep everyone in the loop on things that you're doing. Engage their opinion on events or pieces of work you're currently planning, you know, using polls or open questions, that type of thing. And since I mentioned events a moment ago, um, this is obviously a huge pillar for any community to stay connected. At Surrey, we aim to meet up as a whole inclusive Tableau community roughly once a quarter, involving people from both inside our organisation as well as our partners. And we also branch out to other local public sector organisations that want to be involved. Uh, for instance, at our last few user groups, we had people from, so our partners from East Sussex and Brighton, people from Bexley and the NHS, to name a few. And we're also planning to widen this out further in the, in the upcoming events. And these events are a key fixture in the diary for me. They're something that I really look forward to, and even more so now that I'm organizing them. And the, um, the type of content that we gather together for these events can vary quite widely from event to event. Um, sometimes looking at involving external speakers. Uh, we, were, we were lucky enough to have Andy Creeble come along to our most recent event and run a makeover Monday and revising session, which was awesome, as, as you might imagine. But, um, but you don't always need to go and outsource these kind of things. I think it's quite often very valuable for the members of the community to know what everyone else is up to. So bringing in some stories around how Tableau has been used to address certain problems or challenges can be a really, really fascinating way to understand how your colleagues might be approaching subjects. And there'll obviously be some learning that can be shared through this type of thing. And so as well as the, um, the full quarterly group meetup, we're also looking at having some smaller sessions throughout the year, you know, getting groups of analysts together to complete work on various tasks, upskilling them in Tableau, generally making sure that community stays connected. But, um, but I'll go into that a little bit more in, in a few minutes. Now, um, in my introduction, uh, I mentioned that I work in the Data Analytics Center of Excellence here, and um, Mike uh, was talking about building up the Center of Excellence in his organization. And um, some of you might be wondering what that actually means. <laughs> so before I go on, I think it might be useful to address that now. So a center of excellence uh, can be a great way to introduce a particular platform or technology and embed it uh, together with best practice principles and processes in an organization. And we've gone, uh, we went the way of most organizations in terms of starting out this journey with an IT led center of excellence. And the, the reason for this is that it puts us in a position where rolling out and promoting the relevant technologies at scale becomes a much easier task for a number of reasons. You, know, you, you obviously have back office developers engaged who are able to complete the necessary steps for this to work across teams and across directorates because of their familiarity with the architecture and the te technological possibilities and constraints. We've um, we got individuals who are aware of the overarching data and BI strategy for the organization, people who, um, who are well-versed in the various elements of data visualization, and also people who have experience of the partnerships between the various internal businesses and IT. And I think, I think if we didn't go down this particular route, then it's likely um, we would have encountered a number of barriers along the way and possibly build strategies that don't necessarily align with the overarching organizational strategy. 
So a center of excellence is a great way of ensuring that any implementation can run as smoothly as possible and also be scalable. But that's, that's not to say that members of the community should not get involved, as this whole process is obviously to deliver functionality and opportunities to meet the needs of those various businesses. And there's also, you know, there's probably a lot of talent and experience out there that can supplement this approach. So I've put a, um, a link there to a webinar which goes into this in much more detail. Don't worry about um, scrabbling around for a pen. We will, as Mike said, we will be sharing these slides after the event. And finally, uh, the main thing that I wanted to talk to you about today, and something that I hinted at earlier, is around organising community-based practical events, and specifically for now, Viz Games. So, what are Viz Games? I hear you cry. <laughs> well, um, Viz Games can actually be whatever you want them to be. It's a really cool way of getting members of the community together and sharing their experience and knowledge, mostly in the form of some kind of competition. Uh, you might be aware of all the hype that's going on around Iron Viz at the moment. That's certainly, you know, that's certainly at one end of the spectrum. That can be very intense. That, um, that approach might end up putting a few less confident people off, but it's still an awesome concept. So if you're not familiar with it, I'd suggest checking that out. But you could also look at some kind of presentation competition where contestants come with a pre-built dashboard and present this either to a room of colleagues or a panel of judges or both. Um, but uh, here at Surrey, we decided to take a slightly different approach and combined a couple of um, a couple of different styles, taking the pressure of the timed competition, but with the context of that presented piece of work. So we had requests from a couple of teams um, sitting in our tray to produce some visualizations. And so we decided that this would, um, this would be a great opportunity to road test our planned concepts with these. So we gathered together the members of the Center of Excellence and gave them an hour, a data set they'd never seen before, and uh, a room, and wish them luck. So this was partly about fine-tuning um, the, the admin side of things, um, but also um, as a chance to complete a piece of work that needed doing, as well as uh, to experience exactly what we were about to put the community through. Now, we actually ended up running another one of these before going out um, to the wider community, thanks you know, mostly to the success of the first one, but also um, so we could take the opportunity to get more work done quickly. And, uh, and finally, as a training opportunity for, for the team, as well as some, and some more fine tuning of that actual process. The data sets that we worked with in these initial sessions weren't particularly interesting, um, one of them being based around server alerts. Uh, but it, it was still really refreshing to see all of the different approaches that people took and what kind of analysis they were able to extract from what was a very flat, bland piece of data. This, this obviously filled me with a bit of confidence for the wider sessions as we'd hopefully be sourcing a slightly more engaging data set anyway. Uh, for, these, for these first two trial sessions, uh, we allowed the group 60 minutes to complete a piece of work. And for the first session, that didn't seem too bad, possibly because of our unfamiliarity with the Viz Games process. So we felt that that pressure was a natural part of it. Um, however, we were taking part, when we were taking part in the second session, we did all definitely feel a bit more stretched. In, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard so much panicking and swearing coming out of the team. Probably didn't help either that every 10 minutes I kept announcing a countdown of how much time was left. <laughs> this was strange, as we did think that an hour seemed a reasonable amount of time, you know, given that comparing it up to the Iron Biz competition, contestants only have 20 minutes and generally produce something absolutely mind-blowing. However, what we needed to take into account was the fact that in this case, the data was only being presented on the day and the contestants had no prep time allowed so that all of the data discovery, analysis and design was being done on the fly. This is somewhat different to the INVIS that I mentioned where contestants are giving a data set a week in advance, I think, and then spend that time planning and practicing what they'll be completing and just rebuild the biz on the actual day. So as a result of running through the experience ourselves, we decided to extend the time of the session out a bit. And we also did feel it was a little bit unfair uh, just to spring the data set on the people with no prior warning. So we ended up making a few further tweaks to the process. We put together a simple data dictionary for the data set that we'd be using um, that had some descriptions and data types, as well as a sample of some of the data. And we then sent this out the working day before the event was taking place, just to give, you know, just to give the attendees some time to prepare. So, how did it go? Well, on the, um, on the day itself, we had some good representation from across the organization with people from both adults and children's social care, 
customer services, uh, strategy and performance, fire and rescue, procurement, and business operations, I think. And with a nice cross-section of analysts, we, we hope to see a variety in the visualizations produced, and they really didn't disappoint us in that respect. And in order to fully make use of the time and the resources that we gathered together on that day, we did want a real-life data set that needed some analysis completing on it. So before the session, we'd sent out our proposals to some teams asking if they'd like to put a data set forward and eventually settled on one owned by our customer services department that was looking at contacts that members of the public had had with Surrey and the detail of those tickets that they'd logged. Now we did, we saw some brilliant content come out of this. When we took into account the fact that they hadn't seen the data before, the data set itself was unfamiliar to them, they weren't familiar with this style of working, and they had a limited time frame to complete this. It was, it was really fantastic to see what the guys were capable of producing. And again, having learned, from the, having learned my lesson and lost a few friends from the previous sessions, I decided not to keep on announcing the remaining time in the session. And that didn't mean that people weren't still feeling the tension. So after talking this through with everyone at the end, I think everyone was of the same opinion that the time just flew by. And, you know, obviously we wanted the type of atmosphere to be as relaxed as possible. It's, you know, it's not an exam. However, when you're trying to concentrate and work against the clock, it's inevitable that things will get a little bit quiet. So I, I tried not to disturb everyone too much and just let them get on. So um, after their time was up, and in this case, we ended up going for 90 minutes, uh, everyone then published their completed work to our local install of Tableau Server and talked each other through their visualizations one by one, covering their analytical and design choices. They then anonymously scored each other out of 10 in three different categories, which was analysis, storytelling, and design. And while those scores were being collated, the group was then guided through a critique session of each other's work. Um, now, anyone who's familiar with Makeover Monday might uh, understand the concept, but essentially we went through what we liked about each viz, what we didn't, and what we might do differently. And so the, I think this is a really useful way of approaching the subject of critiquing, as it helps to you know, foster that engagement within the community, helps to improve the critical thinking that goes into the design and the conception of a dashboard, you know, get, getting both positive and negative feedback, as, as well as the opportunity to share some tips and tricks, you know, whether that's technical help using something like Tableau, or analytical tips to help someone think differently about what they are actually able to analyze from a data set. So we then took the um, top three scoring visualizations through to our user group, which was taking place the following week, uh, to vote on at the event. So again, looking for that engagement within the wider community to help with the process, as well as you know, to help spread the word and the benefits that this type of joined up working brings. So we, um, we built an app, which we would use to gather the votes of as many people attending the user group as we could. Then at the end of the session, when all the scores were collated, we had a little presentation. So we had some swag from Tableau to give away. Thank you, Tableau. So some t-shirts, coffee cups, uh, stickers, that type of thing. And also a trophy for the champion, which will then get passed on at the next event and so on. You know, giving people uh, something to look forward to when they're competing. But, but the benefits of taking part don't have to be as material as that. So as well as the obvious training and development opportunities that, that um, people benefit from by taking part, other, other potential options might be something like dedicated time for the winner with members of the Center of Excellence to work on something analytical that they have outstanding in their pipeline, for example. But what was, what was really great for me to see was that immediately following the event, um, where we presented the Viz Games, we started to get approached by various colleagues who had attended the session, asking if they can be involved in the next round. So for me, it was really reassuring to see not only that people who had attended the session were feeding back that it was having a positive impact on their approach to work, as you might be able to see from a couple of the quotes that are on the slide, um, but also that our um, method and approach to implementing this had been well received within the community and that they're now actively looking to start engaging with each other in new ways. So uh, to complete this whole process off, we needed to get our deliverables sorted. So. We sat down with the data owner after the event and pulled up all of the visits created and asked, uh, asked them what they liked, what they didn't. And um, after collating all of these preferences that they had of the different elements from the different visualizations, we pulled these all together and produced a first draft dashboard in a matter of minutes. So in the end, you know, the total resource time allocated to producing this was minimized to the duration of the Viz Games event and the meeting and collating of the preferences afterwards, plus a few minutes of design time.
And obviously in this instance, the end result isn't a piece of data art. It's, you know, it's a functional dashboard giving the owner a quick overview of their data. But given the time allocated to this piece of work, I, I genuinely believe, and I hope, I hope you do too, that the outcome, bearing in mind the time allocated, is considerably better than we could have achieved with traditional design methods and will hopefully offer some significant value to the customer. So um, I hope you've been able to put together why we decided to go ahead with the session in this way and hopefully you'll have seen that by working like this it addresses some of the challenges that I went through at the start of my presentation. So I believe that Biz games, um, using Biz games in this way has definitely helped us on our journey towards joining the community up. Um, getting people from various backgrounds together and working towards a common goal, you know, helps those people to see other ways of approaching their work and realize that there's potential exploitable analytical and tableau talent, possibly only a few offices or, you know, maybe even desks away. It obviously offers some development and training opportunities by introducing that pressure, both in terms of time and in the judge quality of the end result. People will get quicker and better at using tableau and um, coming up with more advanced analytical solutions. One of the major benefits for me in particular is helping people with the ability to look at data sets that they're not overly familiar with and just run with them. Now, people tend to fall into the same patterns of analysis and design when they're used to working on the same data set day in, day out. And, you know, this, could, this can often lead to their output and progression becoming stagnant. So getting people to work outside of this comfort zone can open up opportunities for them in different ways to approach their work. As you saw uh, in the previous slide, there's a deliverable at the end of the session as well. You know, you'll have the combined efforts of a number of skilled analysts and Tableau users, enabling you to pick and choose what you like and what you don't to deliver the best possible work in as short a time as possible. Um, now, I've mentioned uh, this a couple of times already today, but there can be disparate teams working across an organization on pieces of work that might be very similar. This can end up being a very costly process. You know, so, so events like this can reduce the need for formal training, and you know, we're, we're all from the public sector here. I think we all know the pinch of budget cuts. So at a time like this, this style of working, a method for developing our existing staff could seem more attractive than ever. And last but not least, it's great fun. So I've gone on a little bit today around the organizational benefits of Viz Games, but it's also really exciting and engaging for those taking part. And sometimes I think that adding that enjoyable creative element into a community can give it the boost it needs to, you know, step it up to the next level. But sessions like this don't have to take the format that I've described and don't even need to involve computers or technical abilities at all. Now, I made a mention earlier around Makeover Mondays. And as I said, we were lucky enough to have Andy Kriebel at our last user group who led that session around the principles. Um, uh, and how you approach your um, visualization and analytical um, methods. And there's no reason that you can't rip off. And by rip off, I obviously mean take lessons from this methodology and you know, use them within your own communities. For example, we're setting up um, revising sessions at the moment where either we'll present some visualizations to the group or they can submit their own. And we can go through them as a group or break down into smaller groups and you know, take a step back from the computers and just look at what we're actually trying to achieve with the visualization and whether it gets the message across in the best possible way. And then at the end of that session, we can go on to redesign it and have a deliverable product or products at the end, which we can go back to the services with to help them with their understanding of their data, which essentially you know, is what this is all about. So if, um, if you wanted to start looking at some resources to build up data communities within your own organization, again, there's some really helpful resources on the Tableau website. There's a page called your Tableau Community Toolkit, yep, up on the slide at the moment, um, which has some really cool suggestions and ideas. And that's actually what got me started on the path of implementing Viz Games here at Surrey, and also where I stole the Viz Games logo that you might have seen on a previous slide. Um, and another suggestion that I'd have is for you to register for and attend, you know, other physical user groups that, um, that might be happening locally to you. There's a, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge and support out there that you can draw on, get ideas from, or even ask specific questions about how to get things started, or just improve on what you've already got within your own organization. So I'd say it's always worth checking out what's happening in your area. So I am... Um, I hope this has been a useful insight into one element of our approach here at Surrey to fulfill our goal of having a self-sustaining, joined up, community-based data culture. And as I mentioned at the start, I feel that we are still in the early stages of this journey towards fully fulfilling this ambition. 
And the method of approach that we've used so far is one that's tailored to the structure of our organization as well as the staff. And so obviously there might be some bits that you can relate to and some maybe not so much. But I hope at least that this has been interesting and has provided you with some ideas or suggestions that might be relevant to you along the way. And if anyone would be interested, I'd be more than happy to come back on this subject in the future and give you an update on how we've been getting on and what changes we may have needed to make along the way to improve it. So that is all from me today. And I think now we're moving on. If anyone had any questions for Mike or myself. Okay, so I can see a question here um, from Afuri. He's saying, hi, James, I use Yammer for a focus group, but I'm the only contributor. How can I get others to contribute? Are they this shy? <laughs> um, that's, I, I can relate to that question. <laughs> as, I, as, as I mentioned uh, during, the, um, during the presentation, we, we're using Jive forums here. And uh, I think as, um, I'm tend to be the main contributor to these. Um, so getting people to start engaging with each other can be a bit of a slow burner, but now we are starting to see people post questions, um, uh, ask for help from one another, uh, interact with the polls and the posts that we're getting on there. So I think it's, it's about showing people the benefits of um, joining up as a community. So when people, you know, it might be uh, that people are relying on a single point of contact to try and um, to try and get their support around visualization principles or technical help uh, and that that person or that team might not always be available so once the word starts getting out around the other exploitable talent that's in the organization it will start to snowball but um, but it is a difficult one to get off the ground <laughs> So I hope that answers your question, but I'm not sure whether it actually does. Do you want me to take this next question, James? Yeah, yeah I can see there's another one there if you want that, yeah. Mike. Okay, so we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. With 60% local government cuts, how well does it sit with yearly subscriptions for Tableau compared with the standard one-off Excel costs? They add it isn't a Tableau bash, but awareness of very limited local government resourcing. So I think for me, the kind of standard stock answer to the beginning part of this is from my perspective, we're comparing apples with pears. Excel is very much a kind of spreadsheet tool and um, Tableau is a data exploration and discovery tool. And I think Microsoft themselves realize that, which is why they've significantly invested in developing Power BI. Now for me, Tableau empowers consumers to generate their own intelligence and insight through a very user-friendly visual interface. Whereas with Excel, you almost need to answer questions for users in advance and drilling down into data is more difficult, making it difficult for consumers to explore that kind of data and information at a granular level. <clears throat> Part of it, I suppose, in terms of the business case for investing in Tableau is realizing and understanding the potential benefits and value of data visualization as a way of engaging staff across the organization with data and analytics. Um, just from a kind of an efficiency side, certainly from an organization the size of ours, um, once you get to grips with Tableau, particularly from an analyst perspective, um, analyzing data is much quicker than it is in Excel through the kind of intuitive drag and drop functionality. So we make a mis mistake in Tableau, two seconds, drag, drop, you're on. Make a mistake in Excel can be a bit more time consuming in terms of reverse engineering some of the processes. And I think for me as well, um, in terms of the limitation in local government resourcing, I think it's part of the work in terms of understanding that investing in not just tools like Tableau, but in data analytics and the use of intelligence and insight will effectively result in more efficiencies and more effective ways of working across local government. I don't know whether you have anything to add to that, James. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, I <laughs> repeat almost everything that you said. <laughs> I think, yeah, the, um, it's, it's a conversation that we come up against quite often around the costing of Tableau versus the costing of other um, dashboarding tools that are on the market. And I, think, and I think that's where the differentiation needs to be made in that there are, you know, there are other um, products out there, um, and, but they are mainly dashboarding tools. I don't think that there's many others that offer that analytical insight functionality in the same user-friendly way that Tableau does. And so it's, um, 
you know, it, it might seem like the the costs compared to some of the other competitors are a little bit higher, but when you kind of start scoring it against um, some of the practical applications that it has, and as Mike said, you know, investment in that data analytics side of things is very key at the moment, you know, with data expanding and expanding people wanting to get more insight out of it. I think it definitely has its place there. Okay. We... Uh, I hope that answers the question. And I don't think we have any more questions. <laughs> so, um, uh, just to wrap things up finally, um, as Mike said at the, uh, at the start of the presentation, so we, um, we have a community forum which we're launching. So this is all UK public sector Tableau users and there's a link to it there. Uh, please, please do sign up and register to that. Start posting, start discussing topics with each other, asking questions. This is going to be a great way that we can all start collaborating with each other. Um, please remember to subscribe to the um, Virtual Public Sector Group uh, page. So when the next event's happening, you'll get updates. When we post anything on there, you'll get updates. And while we're talking about the next event, so we've penciled the next one in for the 8th of July. So in, uh, in just two months' time, just under. Uh, so remember to put that in your calendar and um, thanks to everyone who um, who marked that they'd uh, uh, be willing to present and would be quite keen to put forward their stories at future sessions but if anyone else um, is keen to be involved in any element of it please don't be afraid to contact uh, myself or Mike our email addresses are on the screen there um, so we will be sending uh, the slides round and a link to the recording round after the event, but make sure you sign up to that community forum because we'll be putting it all on there as well. So I just want to thank Mike um, for his really insightful presentation at the start of it. It's really interesting to see where he is on the start of the journey. I want to thank all you guys for um, tuning in and joining us on the start of this collaborative journey within the public sector. And Mike, is there anything you wanted to say before we go? No, I think that's it, James. Um, I'm looking forward to kind of where we could, we could take this community going forward, particularly with some of the challenges. Um, so, yeah, the more opportunities we can look at around collaboration across the sector, um, I think the better for us all. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Cool. Thank you, everyone.